Awesome. We have great attendance. This is a good way to go out with the bang, you guys. Okay. <clears throat> well, hello, friends. We're live. Um, so let's just get to it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, today is a bit of a bittersweet day because it marks our final Wellness Wednesday session of the year. We hope we always hope that, you know, you learned a lot and maybe even held us in the same regard as your podcast pals, <laughs> uh, you know, someone you can turn to for advice and enlightenment and a ton of um, aha moments. Um, we will just be saying goodbye for now. And we hope to come back to you sometime in the near future with a slate of new and interesting topics. Um, you know, maybe it's virtual, in person, both. Either way, we'll we'll keep you guys posted. Um, you know, living in a community of pioneering healthcare experts like the one that we have here, um, there's just no shortage, you know, when it comes to topics and subtopics within the larger health sphere. And as the past few years have taught us and have shown us, you know, we're all as engaged as ever in our personal health journey and in our patient advocacy um, and healthcare settings. Um, by the way, I'm Jamie Korf. I'm an editor at Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine, and I'm also the host for this series. Um, today, I will be in conversation with Dr. Michael Hennis, um, who I will endearingly refer to as Dr. Mike. Uh, we featured him on here once before. He talked about um, how exercise is medicine for the brain. And today he will be shedding light on a much buzzed about term that we've seen splashed all over the headlines and TikTok videos. Um, and that's the Vegas nerve and um, Vegas, by the way, not the city of lights, Vegas. Um, but even though it's buzzed about, it's not, it's not buzz. It's not just a passing fad. There is merit to the effects that it has on our bodies and in our overall physical and, and mental health and well-being. And there are tangible benefits to reap uh, when you learn how to activate it or, or stimulate it. Um, we have all, and I'm speaking collectively here, <laughs> been sort of like entangled in this fight or flight mode for the past several years um, for reasons. And it's taking a toll on us. Um, Fight or flight is great when, you know, you're presented with a real like legit threat or, you know, endangerment to your life, like uh, running into a bear while you're camping. <laughs> but um, when, when that's kind of your operating, your primary operating mode, it becomes detrimental. So um, Dr. Mike will be explaining more about that in explicit detail. So just make sure you gear up for some really interesting nuggets of information. Um, and before we get into it, I just want to drop a quick note that this series would not be possible um, without the backing of our sponsor, Northwestern Health Sciences University. Our Be Well partnership that we've forged together um, brings about two blog posts a month on mspmag.com. Um, and that's been centered in various natural health topics. There are so many thought leaders like today's guest um, that are at the helm of the school and they're right there, Bloomington. So they teach chiropractic care, uh, Chinese medicine, acupuncture, and a whole host of other things. And then they have an onsite clinic where you can receive those services. Um, so, okay, Dr. Mike, he's a chiropractor who specializes in functional neurology, um, which focuses on the central and peripheral nervous system. Mike, you might need to fact check me there. <laughs> he treats patients who are recovering from concussions and brain injuries and strokes and neurological degeneration and so much more. So let's, let's give him a warm welcome or a warm return. Hi, Dr. Mike. Hello. Thank you very much. You're over here, not over here. I'm going to keep looking over here. So don't, uh, <laughs> not ignoring you. That's just where your face is. That's okay. That's okay. I mean, to be honest, this is so awkward because it's like I'm looking at you, or I'm looking at the person on the screen, but I like need to look into right. the lens. So, the we're all, we're all yeah, up. it looks like you know you're kind of like eye contact averted, but right. that's not the case. So, so let's get started. I'm 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 being very mindful about the time because oh. um, you know, your colleague, Dr. Reese, Dr. Mm -hmm. Rice. I never remember Dr. Mm -hmm. Eric Rice. He was the source for our Vegas nerve post that we did um, a few mm -hmm. months ago. And because it generated so many click throughs, um, 
I mean, the metrics were through the roof. We knew that there was something there, that this was a red hot topic. And that's you know how it manifested into today's session. So we received a record number of question submissions from our registrants. So we will do our hardest to get around to all of those. Um, all right, before so the pressure end. is what you're saying. So, okay, Dr. Mike, all things bag is nerve. Like, let's get into it. But before we jump, Fully in, can you just give us sort of a primer on the sympathetic nervous system? Like, what is the value of it? What is it? Sure. What does it do? What doesn't, what doesn't it do? Okay. So I'm going to back up one step further because sympathetic is half. Okay. We have the autonomic nervous system and its job is to control all of the stuff that you don't think about. So think of it kind of like this. We always hear that we only use 10% of our brains and that's not true. It would be closer to say we use 10% of our brains consciously, which is also not true. Um, but the autonomic nervous system is the part of the brain that controls everything that you don't think about, right? Some of it we have influence over. So if I tell you to hold your breath, you can do that. But as soon as you pass out or you fall asleep, you breathe at a normal rate or your heart rate or your body temperature or digesting or panicking or all of that stuff is all autonomic, okay? So we have two parts to that. We have a sympathetic and we have a parasympathetic. Sympathetic is the part that will dilate your pupils and tighten your skin and increase your blood pressure and increase your heart rate, increase your breathing rate. When something bad happens, you're stressed out, you see the car in front of you swerve, you're out hiking and you hear something coming up behind you that you didn't know it was there. All of these panic situations or uh, the parts where you need to be stressed out, that's sympathetic. We also have parasympathetic, which is the exact opposite. You're resting, you're digesting, you're healing, you're meditating, all of these things, okay? Now, another, oh, I guess, misnomer is that you can be uh, shut one of them off. Now this happens, right? We can get a, a sympathetic freeze or like you panic and you just freeze in place, right? We see this with deer all the time, the deer in the headlights and it just sits there and then you hit it because it panicked. And if it would have just run away, everybody would be more happy. Uh, so that does happen. Um, but these two things are always working, right? We always have sympathetic and parasympathetic working simultaneously doing things at the same time. One of them might be working more, but we don't typically just shut one of them off, right? They're always, always working together. So that kind of brings us around to our main topic today, right? We're talking mostly about vagus nerve. Typically when we think vagus nerve, we think sympathetic act, or I got it wrong anyway, parasympathetic activation. Uh, so we're more concerned with that rest, the digest, the kind of relax. And then I like to throw in healing because you can't really heal if you're in that panic state. Your body is just not designed for it. So we really have to teach ourselves to calm down, take a moment for ourselves and make this part of our lives so that we can heal appropriately. And that's, that's really um, kind of my angle with talking about vagus nerve and, and why we use it with all of our rehab and all of our patients. And uh, you're absolutely right. It's a super common topic. We've gotten more questions about vagus nerve stuff um, in the last year than we have um, in times past. So it's, it's getting to be a mainstream thing. People know about it. They've heard about it. They want to know um, what it can help for. You sent me the, the pre-submission questions and there's some, there's some good ones in there. There's a couple of them that are a little hard to follow because I'm just missing information. So we'll do it with sure. Stan. So sure. yeah, that's that's the the sympathetic and parasympathetic, and uh, I guess an autonomic rundown. Um, you know that brings me to this question. I was thinking about this earlier today. Um, why do you think? I mean, and this is speculative, of course, but why do you think it's being so talked about when this isn't exactly a novel thing, right? Like, or have we recently discussed? Discovered it? Like, I guess, what can you attribute all the buzz to? Part of it has to do about it. I think a lot of it has to do with when medicine started really getting standardized. And this is long, long ago, but we just, we, we started to look at base anatomy of the vagus nerve. And we tend to think of vagus nerve as a motor nerve, right? So we have, we have two types of nerves, nerves that take information out from our brain and spinal cord and nerves that bring information in, right? There's obviously neurons in the brain that run only within the brain, but in the, in the rest of the body, most of it's in or out. And 
a lot of people, um, and I'm guilty of this as a student as well, but you stop and think of the vagus nerve purely as an output nerve, okay? If it's purely an output nerve, you don't really have to worry about it so much as uh, giving information. So if you're going to use the vagus nerve as a therapy, you have to remember that it brings information back to the brain. And that's usually not where we talk about it. We talk about the vagus nerve and its ability to influence our heart rate or influence our digestion or influence um, other internal organs and all of that stuff. So if you're thinking about it as an output, we don't you're not going to think how can it be used therapeutically. The other thing is we're starting to be able to study and understand how uh, the stuff that you can do at home will stimulate vagus nerve. And we're concerned about our stress and we're concerned about, um, like you said, the, the unnamed incident of the last couple of years and how it's just changed our, our mental mindset. And what can we do at home to do that stuff? And with, with the internet, which you know isn't a new thing, but people are really starting to write about it and talk about um, things that you can do to influence the vagus nerve and its tone and um, influencing that, that autonomic nervous system. And again, your ability to heal is what it really comes down to. So it's just the public is getting smarter. Um, and healthcare is, I'm not going to say catching up, but uh, mainstream healthcare, I guess, is starting to catch up. Uh, one of the issues we always see is that we find something super cool that works, and then it takes 20 years to implement it. And that's just, that's a consequence of research, unfortunately, but that's kind of the way it works. So um, yeah, we don't all have time to sit and read papers all day. So it's, it takes a little bit to get some of that stuff in, but it's, it's getting to be pretty common now. So um and a lot of it, like I said, it's just the public is starting to know about it. So they're asking questions and forcing us to, to read those papers. Right. Right. And that's a, that's a good, that's a good thing that's yeah. come out of, you know, us, like I was saying before, advocacy for ourselves. Um, there's, there's I guess the benefit of, I mean, we're finding that it applies to so many more things as well. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, okay, well, it worked really well for this, that condition. So concussions, concussions and migraines have a lot in common in their, in their processes. Well, if vagus nerve stimulation works really well for a migraine, why don't we try it in concussion rehab? Hey, we're getting some similar results. So we're also broadening the, the number of conditions that we're using it for. So again, that just leads to awareness. Dr. Mike, how do you know if you're stuck if you're kind of mired in a state of hypervigilance? Is, is it what you were saying before? Maybe um, it's not a legit threat. It's something small or, or minor that gets your heart rate going. And, and so that's, I don't know, it's, it's heightened. Um, like what, do you have any examples of what, like, a what that looks like a, a stuck state of, of hyper awareness? Yeah. So there's, there's the overt, like there's an incident, right? If we go back to a deer in headlights, like that's, that's the epitome of it. You just, you freeze, right? Sympathetic freeze. Maybe there's a fear response. Uh, the part of your brain that senses fear, the amygdala actually has the ability to basically shut everything else around it off. Um, so you can have that. That's by far not going to be the most common scenario. Um, however, stuff like being constantly afraid to go outside for fear of getting sick or um, things like PTSD, if you have an injury or something like that, right? You get in a car accident, you're afraid of the intersection you got hit in. Um, things like that will cause sympathetic increase, constant stress at work. So um, sales professions are notorious for this because they have huge deadlines. They have huge numbers. Um, I can't imagine journalism is that much different because you have so many deadlines you have to hit constantly. I can barely put one paper together at a time, much less <laughs> tracking 30 articles. Um, so stuff where you have a, a big workload, um, Maybe you're trying to balance working from home with kids and you still haven't set up that dedicated office space or uh, financial stress or just the way we've designed our lives, particularly in this country. Um, we're constantly under stress and we don't, we're not very good at checking out, right? I was on vacation a couple of weeks ago, still had contact by email and text message. So, you know, how much was I really relaxing? Don't be wrong, I feel great coming back. Um, but again, it's just kind of where we've, we've designed ourselves. So how do you tell is you wake up in the morning and you're still tired or you're constantly stiff and sore, or you just don't have the energy or you've, you know, you're, you're pounding coffee and living off of it to keep yourself going. Um, we don't sleep enough in this country. That's another, another issue. And I'm, I'm guilty as charged on that one too. So, 
um, little pot calling the kettle black, I think there. But um, another thing that we see all the time is you're, you're kind of constantly sick, right? You're just kind of low grade, always sick. Maybe you're constantly getting a cold or the sniffles or something like that. Um, those can all be indicators that you're not healing appropriately. Again, you're not getting that parasympathetic tone back up to the point that you can recover. Um, it can be kind of hard to tell. There are some metrics you can use, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but they're not, they're not 100%. It just kind of comes down to realizing if you're in a healthy state or not on the wellness spectrum of things. If we start to have some other issues, which we'll get into, then it's a little easier to tell. But um, chances are, if you're stressed out, you're probably in a sympathetic state, kind of the definition of it, and we need to do some things to recover for that. The good news is it doesn't take a lot of time, and uh, it's one of those things you just have to prioritize. It's kind of like working out, but you could do it in a shorter amount of time, right? You don't need an hour. You don't need two hours. Uh, you need about 10 minutes, so. So you're saying that the vagus nerve is in charge of your immune function as well, Right. Not directly, but yes, directly. there is some, some influence on it for okay. sure. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it at that. It's... So that sounds like a fun cycle. Yes. <laughs> Feeling tired and getting sick all the time and yeah, not you're being able to. Out. You're, not, you're just not in a place to heal. And it's, you know, I always explain it to patients is you, your body is designed to heal. But if you're constantly running away from the thing that's that's causing your problem. You're constantly in fear of it. You're living in fear of your diagnosis or you're in fear of what's wrong with you. you you'll, you're never going to get to the point that you can't heal. And sometimes we have to sure. accept the answer that we're not going to know 100% what it is. And we sure. just have to start taking that first step and doing something about it. And as we chip away at those symptoms, we'll start to see some improvement, but you may awesome. not always get a diagnosis with some of the complex stuff too, but I'm going off. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, this is all great. I also just wanted to swoop in because it occurred to me that I was, you know, I was talking about those, um, those pre-submitted questions from, from our audience, but I also just want to clue in our audience, let them know that you can submit a question at any time during our conversation, something piques your interest, or you want Dr. Mike to elaborate on something a little bit more, just jump in at any time. I mean, this is, we want this to be a very conversational structure for everybody. Um, Dr. Mike, you keep talking about toning the vagus nerve. And that's just, it's so weird for me to reconcile like what I associate toning with, like, you know, you're trying to get abs at the gym. Like how do you tone a nerve that's in your body and the longest cranial fiber in your body? Like what, what does that mean? Can you sure. kind of break that down for the rest of us? So tone is maybe a misnomer, but think of it we can, we can talk about it like a muscle. So you have two types of muscle, right? You have the, you have skeletal muscle, like your arms and legs, they go move around and everything like that. But then you also have the close spinal muscles, right? They're all skeletal muscles, but the, the spinal and core muscles, they work a little differently. They are designed to work for long periods of time and keep you upright. Whereas if I want to go pick up my pen, I'm not using my deltoids, my biceps, the muscles of my arm as constantly as I am the muscles of my neck, okay? When we have a tight muscle, the tone of that muscle increases, right? It's actually contracting to hold you in a certain place, right? Nerves can work the same way. How much is that nerve firing at any given time? So with the vagus nerve, how much output is it giving at any time? And then also how much information is it taking in from the rest of the body, right? So we talked about earlier how a common misconception is that the vagus nerve is mostly motor output or sending information out. That's only actually only about 10% of what it does. The remaining 90 is all the information coming back into our brain. So it's a huge sensory piece. Um, and so we have to consider where we're getting that information from. Our gut and our digestive tract actually has the as many neurons or just about as many neurons as our, our, the rest of our nervous system does. So it's very important. We have that enteric nervous system and that information all travels back up the vagus nerve. So we have to be able to, I guess when we're talking about tone, we're more concerned about the motor outputs, so how much information is traveling down that nerve and how much um, 
parasympathetic activity do we get? So if we, if we, if we talk about tone, are you parasympathetic or sympathetic dominant or which one is working more, which one is more effective or how quickly can you switch between them is more what we're talking about with tone. Is there a difference? This is gonna sound really naive. <laughs> I know there's another person out there that maybe might have the same question. And if not, well, then I'm just gonna put myself out there, but is toning the nerve the same as activating it or is that an entirely different premise that we're dealing with there? That's a great question. Um, you can activate the nerve by doing things like applying electric stim to it. You can do it through things like meditation. You can do it through, it's affected by sleep, all of this stuff. So that would be overtly activating it. Tone would be, I guess, what it does on its own. So where does it sit? Oh. Is it more likely to be activated or not, right? If you're super pain, oh, okay. it's gonna be harder to activate that vagus nerves output or activate its calming parasympathetic effect. Why? Because if something's chasing you, you don't want to decrease your blood pressure. You don't want to decrease your heart rate, right? So that vagus nerve tone, if you will, is going to be decreased. Your parasympathetic tone is going to be decreased. Your sympathetic tone is going to be higher. Its resting state is going to change. That's tone. Activation is your willingness to turn it on or off or your brain's ability to turn it on and off. And we can, we can influence that a little bit more. Okay. Okay. So if I'm picking up what you're putting down, that's like, that's measuring the, the output um, of your parasympathetic and your sympathetic. Yes. Okay. Um, we have a question from the audience and you kind of touched on this a little bit, Dr. Mike, mm -hmm. what things can we do at home to stimulate or activate the vagus nerve? Great question. And probably the next logical place to go. So there's all sorts of stuff we can do to stimulate vagus nerves. Some of it works a lot better in a clinical setting, mostly because it takes equipment that can be fairly expensive. Um, but some of it is definitely within reach of the average person and can be really useful. So um, there's all sorts of stuff that activates vagus nerve. Cold exposure, so um, you just think of like the, the polar plunge or cold showers or stuff like that or cold water on your face can activate vagus nerve. It doesn't have to be freezing cold, right? You don't have to take an ice shower or anything like that. Uh, it just has to be uncomfortable. Um, and it doesn't have to be for super long. Breathing exercises, meditation is great for activating vagus nerve and in influencing vagus nerve tone. Um, meditation is basically paying attention to your thoughts. And the easiest way to get started with it is paying attention to your breathing, right? Look up some breathing exercises and that's the, the easiest way to get started. Um, there's also great apps that are relatively cheap subscription based. I'm completely drawing a blank on what they are right now. Um, I just learned Fitbit has a whole, like they have a catalog of different meditations on their app. Yep, I just absolutely. discovered this the other night. I don't know in, how helpful is that? You can type in meditation app. Some of them have little things that come with it. Um, there's a new one in development now with an EEG that actually measures brain wave activity while you're doing it. So you can track that. Um, if you're the type of person that likes to gamify your health, how many steps did I get in a day? Am I tracking my water intake? Um, you can look at things like tracking your sleep, um, watching your sleep cycles undulate. So going in and out of deep sleep and superficial sleep and REM sleep that has consequences based on your vagus nerve tone or your, your autonomic tone. Um, heart rate variability is really probably the biggest measure. So how, um, how quickly you're able to change your heart rate, right? If you work out, your heart rate should go up, but it shouldn't be high three hours later. How much is it changing um, in, in that realm? Um, other stuff you can do at home, um, exercise, honestly, any kind of aerobic exercise or uh, even heavy strength training, it really doesn't matter on the type of exercise. Um, it does kind of matter that you're enjoying it though, right? If you if you really hate exercising, it's probably going to stress you out more than it's, I shouldn't say more than it's going to help you out, but we don't need the added stress. So um, it doesn't have to be intense walking counts. So even if it's a matter of you don't really like exercising, but you love listening to podcasts, all right, so carve out a half hour, listen to your podcast and walk while you're doing it. Treadmills, uh, it's cold now, so most malls have walking programs. Um, big indoor buildings, right? I like the Mall of America because it's like one and a quarter miles all the way around. You've got three mm -hmm. floors, so you can 
you can cover some serious distance. Um, other stuff you can do to activate the nerve, gargling to some degree, right? You can gargle and that will stimulate the back of the throat, which is controlled by cranial nerves nine, cranial nerves 10, and they live next to each other in neurons that are close in proximity. If you fire one, you're gonna stimulate the other. Um, yeah, I don't wanna tell people that because that can cause problems. Uh, you can use things like uh, vagus nerve stimulators at home. There's two types, there's an implantable type. These are surgical, um, not something that's going to be super useful here. They're used in big pain syndromes, but they've been around forever. Uh, but they have a whole host of problems. You open yourself up to infection because you actually have a wire running under your skin and all that. And you have to have a surgery to have it put in. Okay. Um, but they're, they're, really yeah, they're, they're portable ones. And um, I don't, I guess I don't really want to give brand names over a webinar like this, but you can, there's some pretty common ones that they run really light electrical current just through the neck where the vagus nerve kind of runs down. Um, they're pretty well studied. They're FDA approved devices. They've got uh, consequences in migraines. I've been using them in concussion rehab quite a bit um, and they work really well. Um, they've got a little bit of cost associated with them, but if it's something where you're suffering from a condition that benefits from it, migraines particularly, um, migraines, yeah, and it's, it's super useful and you know, spending a couple of a couple of dollars to not have any migraines anymore and not be on ten different medications to manage it is uh, yeah. So, um, other stuff if wow. you look at stuff through through history, uh, we've got a huge host of stuff that we did to activate vagus nerve, and we didn't necessarily know we were doing it. Um, meditation is huge throughout history, chanting, praying, anything that has kind of that community rhythmic thing. If you ever walk into a church pre-service, um, you walk in, everybody's praying and it kind of puts a buzz in the room and everybody kind of gets in sync. Uh, drum circles have huge pieces with the vibration that they add to it. Um, so that can be big. And even things like uh, massage where it just forces you to relax can be stimulating for it so there's really lots of stuff you can do routinely i'll send people home with like cold exposure therapy so again showers um cold water on your face uh humming gargling singing loudly i mean if you're the only one in your car let it go i mean <laughs> stimulating those vocal cords um, all of that is is stuff that's underrated when it comes to activating vagus nerve but it's all stuff you can do at home and most of it's free the cold exposure is that something that you would just implement into your routine like yeah so for you me, know you used to, i mean you hear about like you know you take a hot shower at the end um, you know, turn the handle all the way to the other side and, you know, finish it I'm off. Not, with yeah, 30 I'm not seconds. hardcore, but I'll turn it back to the point where it gets a little uncomfortable and try and stay under there okay. for a few minutes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my favorite part of shaving is cold water at the end, even though it, oh. I really don't like it. I don't enjoy it, but it's refreshing and wakes me up. <laughs> so, um, you don't want it to hurt. You don't want, like, if you're doing cold exposure, you're doing like an ice bath or something like that. You can't have anxiety about doing it right if you're just that hurting, defeat the purpose that's that's defeating the purpose right there's some there's physiological effect but if you're psyching yourself out for it you're not helping yourself out um one of our attendees wants to know if acupuncture is something that can also um help alleviate or activate the the vagus nerve so acupuncture is something that I, despite actually working out of the school, am notoriously naive about. I know very little about acupuncture, okay. um, but it really does seem to do that. So we've got vagus nerve points all over. I will actually use a, a, hmm. a electric current through tragus, through the ear and the concha, and there's all sorts of acupuncture points in there. Um, so I suspect if we were to look at acupuncture from a Western lens, you're stimulating some of these pressure points, some of these acupuncture points, and they're affecting vagus nerve tone. Um, mm. But yeah, like I said, I'm notoriously naive when it comes to acupuncture. I love it when I get a cold or the flu or something like that, but I really, I let the practitioner do the thing and I don't ask questions because it's not something I'm very well educated in. Um, there was a question that we received in advance that um, just really struck list. me as, what's that, Dr. Mike? I'm trying to find the list in my email, but oh. I don't know where it went. Do so. you want to resend it to you? I'm going to have to rely on you for it. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, why, 
and how does what's happening in our digestion system or digestive system seem to travel up to the brain and create anxiety? I saw that. that yeah, this was one of the questions that I wasn't quite sure what they were trying to ask. Well, I wonder if it's that whole, you're talking about how, you know, the nerve is, it's in, it's in our gut, it's in our brain. Is that, that's probably why we call it the second brain, right? It runs right. through all of that. Um, so there's but I don't of, know. Yeah, there's all sorts of sensory information that comes up from the gut. And I talk about this with patients all the time. If they've got, especially um, if you have gut symptoms, it's easy, right? You've got gas, you've got poor digestion, you've got really bad indigestion, you've got all the, all the classic gut symptoms. It's when you don't have classic gut symptoms, but we still have to look at gut health. So uh, maybe you've got... Uh, really dry skin, or you're just not digesting stuff really well, or a couple of foods that don't agree with you, or um, you're really inflamed, all stuff that I'm going to start to wonder if that gut is affected. Um, and we see huge, huge impact of brain health on gut. So if your brain's not working well, we know your gut's not working well. That's well established in literature. So um, even if you're not noticing the symptoms, or we haven't taught you how to notice the symptoms yet, there's probably something there. Um, as far as creating anxiety, I'm not quite sure about that aspect. We might get some more anxiety if we're not getting information back up. Um, but if there's all sorts of inflammatory information in the gut, or there's insult, or um, let's say you've got a gluten sensitivity or a dairy sensitivity, or you can't eat tomatoes or nightshades, uh, green peppers, potatoes, stuff like that. If there's something that irritates your stomach, and you're eating it anyway because you love the way it tastes. Uh, for me, that's green peppers. I love them. They do not love me, uh, um, but I, I tend to eat them anyway. Um, so do as I say, not as I do sometimes, but um, that can cause some inflammation. That's gonna come up and signal the brain um, through the vagus nerve. And so maybe that's what we're getting at. I guess I don't know that I've seen it cause anxiety directly, but it certainly isn't, isn't doing us any favors because now our brain's getting this signal that says, Hey, something's wrong down here. You need to pay attention to it. Uh, but we're not really going to know where it is. We don't localize pain in our, in our, in our organs very well. We don't have a lot of pain receptors. So it's more going to be a general sense of something's wrong. Um, so that might be some anxiety, or maybe there's some research I'm not aware of, or maybe I don't understand what the question's getting at either. So I don't know. Sorry if you ask that question, yeah. I'm not hitting it. <laughs> That's okay. And if, if that person is sitting on this call, they can always like, they can, they can pipe in too. Um, with the follow-up question to that, there is another really interesting question that I just got. And it's about, so the vagus nerve that involves sensory, you were talking about sensory Dr. Mike that's involved with your senses like your sense of smell yep. um this person wants to know so this sounds like there might be some sort of connection here can can this help so I'm guessing this is you're toning your your vagus nerve um help with regaining smell lost from COVID that's an interesting one and there's I'm going to say the short answer is no not directly However, it's going to come back to that thing we talked about earlier. If you're not in a place to heal, your body's really going to struggle to, I guess, downregulate that immune system to get it out of that panic state so that you can actually start to heal. Um, I think last time we talked a little bit about inflammation. This is where inflammation kind of gets a bad rap. You need inflammation to prompt that immune system to heal. But if there's too much inflammation, you can't heal. So vagus nerve can have some consequences on that. But I wouldn't go as far as to say, if I stimulate your vagus nerve and that's the only thing we're doing for you, that you're going to get your smell back. I wouldn't say it's that direct. But I also wouldn't say that that's going to have no effect on your ability to heal those olfactory nerves, right? It kind of depends how you lost the smell. I'm assuming it's um, COVID related because that's what's going around. Um, right. But if it were say traumatic, your airbag went off and you broke your nose and you actually sheared those nerves off, there's probably not a lot that's gonna happen. And we do see that, but if it's COVID mm -hmm. related and it was more nervous inflammation, then we might have a little better shot at using vagus nerve therapy as an adjunct or a, a supporting therapy to, to help get that smell back. So kind of a sure. no and yes and question. Hmm, interesting. Maybe if someone is kind of like they've exhausted their options, that's something that they could 
consider looking into, but like you said, as a support or adjunct. Yeah, yeah. Is- and it's one of those things like I would, I would start doing vagus nerve therapy for it right away, rather than looking at it as well, I'm at the end of my rope, I should try something else. Um, mm. We do vagus nerve therapy with almost everybody that comes into our office because of the consequences that it has on the brain. Um, yeah. There was a, one of the questions you sent me had something to do about um, vagus nerve and stroke recovery. And there's a lot of research around this, but it's not that stimulating the vagus nerve helps you heal from the stroke. It's that it makes the rehab that you're doing, the stroke rehab you're doing, it makes the rehab more effective. But if you sure. just did vagus nerve therapy, it's going to be a little bit lackluster, but we find that it makes the rehab we do a lot more effective. So in our practice where we're rehabbing things like migraines, we're rehabbing things like brain injuries and concussions, we're doing vagus nerve stimulation after these therapies to make them more effective. Sure, sure. So you, you'll be getting um, sort of the best results when you're sort of lumping that in in tandem. And then like you said, at the onset of something happening, not as like a last ditch resort kind of a thing. Yeah, if you're honestly, if you're undergoing any kind of rehab, whether it's even um, say you're just trying to get stronger, you're working with a personal trainer at a gym or something like that, adding some vagus nerve therapy to your recovery, whether that's at the gym or when you get home is going to help your brain learn those exercises you just did, those movement patterns that you're trying to teach yourself. So uh, when you go to the gym and you start lifting weights, it's really easy for the first month to pack on the weight that you're lifting, right? And then it gets harder because that first month, your brain is learning how to control those muscles, how to control your body to do those things. After that month, now you're starting to actually increase the size of the muscles. And that's the hard part, right? Vagus nerve is going to cut that down. Vagus nerve stimulation is going to help cut that down by, I guess, helping cement in those movement patterns for your brain. So it's really an add-on therapy for a lot of things. Um, things that it has direct effect on, again, I'm going to come back to migraines. It really seems to be vagus nerve tone and stimulating the vagus nerve. It can be a standalone therapy for migraines. Mm. find it more effective if I'm doing other things with it. Um, but if I have to pick and choose, that's going to be a, the top of my list for something like a migraine disorder. That's so interesting. And I, I know it, it might be dangerous to position something as a cure-all. Like that's never, you know, that's never the message that we want to convey, but have you right. found that any of your, your clients or your, your patients, like th- this has helped them and it, hasn't returned or it just, um, occurs less frequently. And I, I, I'm thinking like, personally, I have a, one of my best friends suffers and she's done everything under the sun and it comes back. Actually, so. a couple of the patients that I've had, I'm trying to think now, cause I just, I just got a new Vegas nerve stim device. I have a couple of them and I've got a new one that I, that I really like, um, that's designed for home use. Um, Okay. I've got one with one patient with seizures and one with migraines, uh, and we're down to like, she's getting a migraine about once a week, but keep in mind, this was a daily occurrence. So mm. yes, she still has migraines, but she's down Improved quality of life, right? Right. So quality of life is way higher. And then the, the one with seizures, um, she still gets them, but the recovery is a lot shorter. So it's not something where the vagus nerve stimulation is curing these things, but it's drastically improving quality of life. And again, it's a stim home unit. So they're not coming to me every time uh, they get a migraine or they get a seizure. They're not coming in and coming to my office to get therapy and paying me for it. They own their own device and they're doing this at home um, multiple times a day, actually, in both cases where they're just, you know, they're taking a moment in the morning. They're taking a moment if they have an episode of some kind or they, they feel something coming on and then they do it as at, at the end of the night as just a, a standalone treatment for this stuff. Um, and I've got them doing other exercises, but really the addition of this home vagus nerve stimulator is really kind of what, what is picking stuff up for them. Um, wow, these are just awesome questions. My questions are so like... <laughs> I don't know. They're just, they're, they're not quite as, as complex. And, um, we have a a participant that says, can you give us some minor, just rookie questions is what I'm trying to say. Can you give us some take home things we can do today 
if we are always in hyper mode, and I guess you did kind of touch on that, right, Dr. Mike, maybe mm -hmm. that person just wasn't there for the, sure. the front end of this, we were talking about, uh, you know, splashing your face with cold water, exercising, meditating. Um, but this person says that, wow, as a result of COVID, they develop dis, uh, dysautonomia, yep. uh, POTS as a post viral illness. Is there anything that you can share with that person? Um, I'm not allowed to say I treat that stuff directly, but there's a lot of consequence with the stuff that we're talking about that does seem to help, particularly in, um, POTS. Um, if we don't specify where the POTS came from, we work with that all the time. We see it in, in migraine disorders. We see it in concussion. There's usually some autonomic dysfunction. Um, I don't really care where the POTS came from. I tend to treat it all the same. Sometimes we have to worry about immune system activation if it came from a viral load like, like COVID. Um, so vagus nerve can be huge in, in some of that. Um, a lot of it has to do with retraining your body where it is in space. So sometimes that gets a little, little screwed up with, with inflammatory loads. I don't know. I haven't um, obviously seen this person, but um, so that can be a big piece with it. Um, but I guess to answer the question, are these recorded that they can go back and look or no? Yeah, that's a good point. These are recorded. They're archived on our YouTube channel. Okay. So. so we covered that. So maybe in the quick stuff is you can do some cold exposure. Meditation is great. Um, journaling can actually be another piece of meditation. So if you have a diary, you have a journal, um, it actually doesn't really matter what you write in it. It's the fact that you sit down and put thought into it that becomes meditative. So if your thing is to wake up in the morning and record the weather, that's your thing. Go for it. If you want to talk about what's irritating you, great. What you need to try and avoid actually is uh, complaining about other people in your journal and figure out um, what you can learn from that particular situation. Um, that's a. Well, what if it's therapeutic? <laughs> it, is, it can be therapeutic, but you still have to bring it back to what can you learn from it. Um, yeah, that's, that's good. not me. That's a that's a Stoic philosophy thing, but that's where exactly. the journaling piece came from. But. Um, the bigger piece of that question, I think, is if you're in that hyper state, you have to figure out why that is. And if it's a matter of you're not prioritizing yourself, doing things like humming and cold water exposure and, you know, whatever, all the stuff that we talked about, if you're just adding that stuff in, but you're not worried about trying to fix the problem, you're not taking any time for yourself. And I, I get it, people's lives are com complex and you might not directly be able to do that right away. Um, but simply adding the stuff in may not be enough. We might have to start rearranging some stuff. Um, mm. So it, it, it can be a little more complex. So what I, what I don't want to do is I don't want you to go home and try all of this stuff and say, Dr. Mike, I still feel like garbage. Like, well, right, but we also haven't removed any causes. We tried to treat the thing, but we haven't 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 really tried to fix anything either just yet. So hmm. um, two way street, street, just just like everything else. Well, and I, I I'm gonna just kind of throw in like my personal experience. You know, you're making me think about like there are times where I just feel like a floating head. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Like when I'm in, you know, mom mode, and I think a lot of parents can relate to this. I watch my little guy on Thursdays and Fridays. Um, and I, you know, if you, of course you deprioritize yourself, yeah. you know, you've, you've got a bajillion other to do's on your list, not just necessarily taking care of your kid, making sure that they're alive. <laughs> Um, but you know, it's the house, it's your social life, it's work, it's everything. And it sounds like at the end of the day, these activities, even if they sound minor, they're helpful and sort of bringing you back into your body. So you're not a floating head, right? Like, is that kind of what it just sort of teaches you over time? And that's like a muscle that you can practice. Yeah, exactly. And you and I are, I believe, if I remember right about in the same phase of, of parenting, but when the, yeah. when the kids are first born, right, you, you have to sleep when the kids sleep. So when the kid goes to bed, you're going to bed because you don't know when you're going to be up at night. But now that they're a little older and they sleep a little bit better through the night, all of a sudden I look at it as well, he went to bed, I can get up and do stuff. I should really keep going to bed because I felt great actually when my <laughs> son was really little because I was sleeping more. Right now that he's older yeah. and sleeps through the night, well, I don't go to bed when I should. So that's <laughs> with my own parents. Guilty. Turn, so. so guilty. Right. 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 So um, yeah, I love it. Yeah. Come down to prioritizing yourself and realizing the things that are 
causing that anxiety, causing that sympathetic stimulation, removing some of that, but also adding in some of this vagus nerve stimulating and, and changing your routine to incorporate some of them. Um, other stuff, um, indirectly, stuff like caffeine, high loads of caffeine is very anxiety causing. So I'm not saying don't drink caffeine, but maybe try not to have any after one o'clock. 11 o'clock would be better, but I like an afternoon coffee too. So like I, I get it, we're all human. Um, but drinking coffee at 10 o'clock at night, you're really not doing yourself any favors either. Right. Okay. So don't fall prey to bedtime procrastination and drink <laughs> caffeine earlier in the day. Um, okay. Marie wants to know, she says, actually, she's commenting, would be really awesome if you could share the brand. Sorry, we have the landline. <laughs> Um, I'm at my in-laws. If you could share the brand or something to search on for these machines. Sure. Can I give a brand name on here or no? Yeah, we have before. All right. So the, but do they need like a doctor's referral or recommendation? Yes. Yep. So okay. the one I've been using is called a Gamma Core, G-A-M-M-A -M -M -A Core. Um, and they are by prescription. And um, the research actually started, I believe it was for allergic reactions is what the, the founder founded the company for, uh, but they've got a lot of research around uh, migraines and cluster headaches and that sort of thing. I've been using it as a general vagus nerve stimulating device, right? It doesn't really matter what condition they have. If you're trying to stimulate vagus nerve, it's very good at it. Um, so that's the new one I've been using. We have a couple in the office um, that are a little more they're actually a little bit more low tech, um, which makes it easier to hurt yourself with them, right? Because they're electric stimulating devices. So um, I've got one called a, a mini stim that I use for it, but I would never give that to a patient because there's a little more technical know-how with it. With a gamma core, you literally turn it on and turn it up. Um, but if you're looking for something, they are just peripheral nerve stimulating devices or a transcutaneous, um, meaning through the skin, vagus nerve stimulator. Um, I think Gamma Core is probably the more popular one. But again, that's because it's the one I'm familiar with. I really haven't done much searching on them, if I'm honest. Um, you can accomplish this stuff with, with TENS units. Um, the research isn't quite as much there. It's something like when you have a dedicated device like the Gamma Core, they do their own research. So um, you, can, you can look at that and what their approvals are for. But yeah, the Gamma Core is the one I've been using. Um, use a little ultrasound gel or some conductive electricity and place it up into the vagus nerve and wait till it starts to make your face twitch and let it go for a couple of minutes. And so this is not an implanted one. Um, no, no, no. Um, I don't have it here. I have a bunch of equipment for my visit that I walked in from. I'm yeah. sitting over here, but... That's, um, that's we okay. Also use, we also use lasers in the office, therapeutic low-level lasers. There's, um, a, if you can flash a cell at about 10 hertz, that's a vagus vagal stimulating frequency. Um, so we'll use lasers over vagus nerve. We'll use lasers over the gut, over the stomach that gives a lot of sensory information back to the vagus nerve, um, even into the mm -hmm. brainstem where the vagus nerve starts and terminates is we'll shoot some laser over that as well. But again, lasers aren't something you're going to be doing at home. Okay. Um, okay. We have just just shy of ten minutes left. So if mm -hmm. anyone has any hot or pressing questions, please we encourage you to submit them now. Um, now we did just get one in the chat box, and that's um, somebody inquiring about how adrenal fatigue fits in with all of this. Sure. So adrenal fatigue is actually getting into um, an endocrine, like we're working on hormones and, and glands at that point. Now, adrenals are actually stimulated by sympathetic tone. Uh, a great example of this is um, something scares you, right? You get that jump in your stomach. That's actually a release of adrenaline. Uh, and that's, that's a sympathetic response and a, a, a adrenal response, right? Our adrenal glands, they live on top of our kidneys and they produce these hormones. So if you're fatigued because you're constantly under stress, you're trying to hit your deadlines, you live off of coffee, which stimulates those adrenal glands, you're going to be lethargic. You're going to be tired all the time. You probably need some kind of stimulant. 
uh, you're tired when you wake up and there's there's a whole other host of things right you tend to be a little bit more inflamed so your joints are probably um, achy for no particular reason you've got a brand new bed and you're still stiff and sore in the neck when you wake up you've got brand new shoes but your feet still hurt um, you stub your toe and it hurts for four days instead of 20 minutes or you know all of this stuff um, tends to mean your inflammation's higher but that's probably a consequence of increased sympathetic tone, increased immune activity, and increased all of this stuff from adrenal fatigue. And there's, there's all sorts of other consequences with that as well. Vagus nerve, again, can be a great adjunct to that, but it's going to come up with figuring out why are we so fatigued? What are we gonna do about it instead of just trying to mask it further, right? Because we're, we're doing a great job masking it with caffeine, with coffee, with, with stimulants. Um, there's some supplements you can give to stimulate those adrenal nerves, or at least that's one of the things that I will do about it. But again, it's a stopgap to get you feeling better so that you can do rehab or rehab the system without feeling like garbage while you do it. Um, I don't know if that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good to me. <laughs> um, oh, questions are, are trickling in. Does vagus nerve stimulation help with vertigo? That's a great question. So again, I don't, uh, this is one of those things where I wouldn't take someone with vertigo and say, okay, take this vagus nerve stimulator home and I want you to try it for a month and come right, back. Right, right, right. It might not, but if we're doing some vestibular therapy, we're doing rehab for that vertigo, we're looking at eye movements, we're working on coordination, we're working on balance, we're working on maybe even strength. Maybe you're dizzy because you're not strong enough to interact with the world around you, right? All of these things are pieces of that puzzle and vagus nerve stimulation is another piece of that. It's going to make that rehabilitation more effective. Um, if it's something that's a little more purely autonomic, your dizzy or your vertigo stems from your blood pressure getting too low, sitting to standing in pots, um, then vagus nerve stimulation can be a better tool. But again, it's I see it work a lot better when we're doing other stuff with it. Instead of just putting the stimulator on, maybe we change your positions. We have you lay down, we have you start sitting up till your blood pressure drops, hit you with that vagus nerve stimulator to remind your body, hey, you need to be doing something here. Mm. Okay. So we, we, we try and rehab that reflex. So very rarely will you ever see me just put someone on vagus nerve Right. Right. There's always right. something else we're doing. It's always multiple pieces to that puzzle. So does it help? Right. With Short answer. Yes. Long answer. You need to do more than that. You always need to do more than that. <laughs> um, someone wants to know, Dr. Mike, if you've heard of the David Delight poor electronic system, is it used to activate the vagus nerve for insomnia? I have uh, zero familiarity with that particular device. Okay. Sorry. Could you somehow stimulate, this is another person that just mm -hmm. um, dropped this in. Could you somehow stimulate vagus nerve by using a tuning fork? I guess that's an acupuncture tool, right? Or kind of- Not necessarily. Um, okay. I don't see why not. There's a, there's a device in my world called a ResiMax that uses vibration to stimulate vagus nerve. So I don't see why you couldn't do it with a tuning fork. Um, I'll be honest, I haven't read any research that particular way, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, sure. I don't see why not. You can use, I mean, just even physical activation to putting a tuning fork over, over the vagus nerve. It actually runs fairly superficial through your neck. Uh, not superficial, but your neck isn't that thick. So we can kind of get to it that way. Um, and just the mechanical stimulation, the vibration could very well do it. Um, again, with the lasers, we look at 10 Hertz which is, which is really, really slow. You would never be able to hear it. Um, but if you were vibrating at that frequency, I would think it would, could, could do something. Um, again, that, that vibrating tool we have in the office, they've got all sorts of protocols related to it that are vibration based. So whether you could do it with a tuning fork specifically or not, I'm not sure, but vibration is a, is a great tool for it. Sure. Sure. That's just so interesting to me, the vibration, you were talking about the humming and the chanting. And I'm like, is that, does that kind of go back to our, our roots, like being in the womb and those by, you know, just the outer world, those vibrations, does it kind of bring us back to that, to that time? That's probably <laughs> there, why we find stuff like, 
like ocean sounds to sleep and stuff like that. Super, yeah. super stimulating. But when it comes to like, like chanting and singing and all of that, right, it has to do with we're using those throat muscles. So whether that's yeah. innervated specifically by vagus nerve or it's stimulated by the nerves that are very close to it. So now we're increasing the blood supply to the part of the brain that stimulates vagus nerve, right? Mm. I'm trying to rehab someone and the part of their brain that's not working right is too fragile for me to stimulate it directly. I'll take yeah. a spot right next door to it that runs off the same artery and we're increasing the blood flow to that part of the brain. And I'm indirectly treating it because we have more nutrient, we have more iron, we have more oxygen, all of that stuff mm -hmm. getting to the damaged part of the brain. So indirectly, I'm giving it what it needs to heal. And maybe if we come back a few days later, those neurons are going to be healthier and now I can stimulate it. Same thing in vagus nerve. If I start to work on different parts of the brain that are very close to it, singing, chanting, humming, or by applying an electric current directly to vagus nerve, all of these things are going to be stimulatory or at least somewhat therapeutic to it. Got it. Um, we probably, it's 1258. If anyone has a question, maybe we have time for one more, Dr. Mike. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'll be fine. All right. Well, um, and if there's anything else that you kind of want to impart to sort of cap off, oh, here comes a question, exercises, question mark. Um, okay. Well, we kind of, we did kind of touch on that. Any form of, of exercise will be helpful, right? Whether it's walking, exercise listening to than podcast, no exercise, but again, you can't, you can't only... what you're doing. <laughs> Say that again, Dr. Mike. I said any exercise is going to be helpful. The stuff that's going to stimulate vagus nerve specifically is going to be slower rhythmic type stuff. Uh, tai Chi, yoga, Pilates, the stuff that's forcing you to pay attention to your breathing, the stuff that's forcing you to pay attention and be body aware and almost has a meditative aspect to it. Um, so yoga is great for this. Um, yeah. You know, if there's a, a there's a slight spiritual component to yoga that some people don't like, so go try Tai Chi or go try um, um, Pilates or something like that. And I'm not, I'm saying them like just off the cuff. They're I'm not trying to belittle one or the other, but yeah, uh, you know, the the stuff like that that's going to force those slower rhythmic, very controlled motions and force you to pay attention to your core, pay attention to your breathing and have a meditative aspect are going to activate vagus nerve a little bit more. So things like endurance sports, cycling, swimming, running, the stuff that just becomes very repetitive and you start to get into that meditative spot in your head, right? Mm -hmm. That first mile of running sucks, but the next nine miles aren't so bad because you're just not paying attention to it anymore. Uh, don't get me wrong. I can't run mm -hmm. nine miles anymore, but you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you mean though. It, um, the first mile always sucks. Yes. Yes. The first mile is always awful. And then after that, it's, it's not so bad. Um, well, that's a great example. Because you're not paying attention to it anymore. Um, the Marcy wants to know, there's something about a vagal nerve book suggestion. She's talking about changing eye focus, looking far right, looking left. Um, um, she's getting at there. Where did the chat go? And I can't see it because I just opened chat. So it's, it's um, in the question. I don't know if you have access to that or not. Um, I mean, we can certainly act well indirectly. It's going to be a different part of the brain, but um, activate brain stem using eye movements. I do that all the time. Mm -hmm. um, we actually like pressing the back of the tongue. So pressing the back of the tongue is going to end up stimulating a gag reflex, which is kind of right there along with stimulating local parts of the, of the brain stem to that vagus nerve. Um, oh, interesting. Make sure it's intact. Um, so that's where gargling comes in. If you're kind of mean, yeah, you can use a gag reflex for it. But again, that's kind of mean in, in, in the office, quite frankly, it's dangerous. Because <laughs> the last thing I'm wearing someone's lunch. Um, eye movements, maybe not so directly. Um, if there's a book, I'm not familiar with it. Um, so yeah, sorry, I'm not a little more helpful there. Okay. Well, that's interesting though. I mean, it does, it is aligned with what you're saying about gargling and just getting that area up and moving. Um, do you have time for two more quick questions? It looks like Dr. Mike, Sure. um, does body tapping help to stimulate the nerve? 
body tamping, I did actually see this and I was going to, to look up. I am not familiar. But again, I think if we, we talked a little bit earlier about um, like you walk into a church and everybody's praying and there's kind of a buzz about it or you get drum circles, all this stuff becomes very rhythmic, very uh, like a metronome just constantly going, um, especially if you get... Um, if you think of like, like a drum circle, the whole place is vibrating and that's going to be stimulating for, for some of this stuff. So I don't see why you couldn't do it with, with tapping. And I think, was this one of the email questions or was this? Um, oh, no, it was um, submitted in real time. I don't see why not. I'm not familiar with any, any methods in particular, any research around it. Um, but again, it's, it's not that difficult to stimulate a vagus nerve. It might be difficult to get it to a therapeutic level though. Okay. Lastly, what about music? Is there any relaxing, um, self, man, I don't know what this means. Self, selfageo, or unless that's a typo HZ waves to recommend. No, I got to, I'll be honest. I've seen the word before, but I don't know much about it. So, um, Music can, yes, be a great tool. I'm sorry, I don't have any specific recommendations. Um, okay. A lot of times in neurology, we'll use stuff with, with like repeating rhythms um, or we'll throw, uh, there's some research around uh, like a, a tone that goes in the background um, to simulate different parts of the brain or even stuff like classical where it tends to be a little bit more repeating, but you're not getting distracted with, um, with lyrics or something like that. Um, yeah. So yeah, well, a lot of times I'll use stuff like that, but um, yeah, not something I'm super familiar with. I'll be, I'll be honest on that one. Okay. I think that that's a great way to wrap this up. Thank you so much for stretching beyond the allotted hour, Dr. Mike. Uh, clearly people, I just want to know about this. There's so much there. Yeah. Um, and I feel like the way that you've described everything you've kind of almost humanized this nerve for me because it just feels like such a nebulous thing, but knowing that there are like tangible things that we can do to make a difference um, is just really enlightening. Yeah, um, absolutely. So Neurology is always looked at as a super complex field and there are things that are complex about it, but when it comes down to it, movement is really what we need. And uh, okay. something yeah. like vagus nerve stimulation is not that hard to come by when you when you when you break it down so right right where we say vagus nerve and everybody panics because we said nerve and it's it's must be complex and it it can be but it doesn't have to be yeah and just it's so cool to learn how interconnected it is it puts a lot of things into perspective yes absolutely um, all right well thank you so much for your time today dr mike thanks yeah, for thanks coming for back me. for round two with us you're such a pleasant guest to have on and you do such a, a great way of kind of distilling some of these things for us um, and putting them into, into context, which is always super helpful. Um, and then I also just want to give a big thank you to you, to our audience for, for being a part of this wonderful series this year. And to those who have come back once, twice more, like you are our brand ambassadors. So just thanks for being such a part of this exciting um, series for us. And if you ever have any thoughts or questions on a future session or even a topic, um, feel free to shoot me an email or, you know, jcorf at mspmeg.com. Um, and we're reachable elsewhere too. Just go on our website. So thanks again, Dr. Mike. Thank you, Northwestern Health Sciences. Thank you, attendees. Have a wonderful holiday and uh, we'll hopefully be in touch sometime next year.